You're listening to Ace Podcast Nation, the hottest new podcast network and YouTube channel in the UK, featuring original series, top guests, expert analysts, and more. Check out facebook.com forward slash Nation for news on latest guests and shows. Watch every show in full at youtube.com forward slash Nation. Yes, lads, UFC fight there, Jack, so you. Yeah, you can catch me on the latest episode of Ace Podcast Nation. Make sure to give him a subscribe on YouTube. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash Ace Podcast Nation. And uh, looking forward to getting back on Hey guys, I'm Sai and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, the home of the Danny Batten Fight Show. This is episode number 76 and uh, tonight we will be uh, talking the latest MMA and boxing, plus of course last night's UFC Vegas. And uh, we'll also be talking to a top name from the UK fight scene uh, and uh, touching on a few subjects. Uh, obviously there was no show last week, uh, I was involved in a car accident so I was unable to do the show but we are back. And uh, you can find this sh- this show and all the other shows we do at Ace Podcast Nation. YouTube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation for the videos. Or search Ace Podcast Nation on your favourite podcast or radio platform. And there's over 400 shows on various subjects. And uh, give us a follow on social media. And of course, if you want to just follow the Danny Batten Fight Show, it's at Danny Batten FS on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, there we go. But uh, joining me, as ever, after a week off, is the man himself. He is UK MMA legend, former Cage Warriors champion, Mr. Daniel Button. Welcome, buddy. How are you? Yeah, all right, Si. Um, yeah, what a strange weekend last weekend was. I mean, obviously, it was strange for you for unfortunate reasons, but I missed you. It's weird, mate. It's like the first Sunday in Lord probably well, well, eighteen months or something that we yeah. haven't done a show it was very strange. But it was just one of them, mate. I was in no fit state to be uh, sitting and talking. I'm a bit better now. Still struggling a little bit, but uh, again, uh, again there. Uh, and uh, we are joined tonight. I'm delighted to say by Cage Warriors featherweight, Mr. Steve Amiable. How are you, mate? Very well yourself. Talk a little bit about. Um, about your career and, and how you got into MMA and, and such. But uh, before we do, let's say uh, you've got a, a fight coming up on the, the next Cage Warriors trilogy. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So it's, uh, I'm scheduled for the Friday night on the 25th um, against the new signing that they've got from Finland called Edward Walls. Uh, he's 10 and, 10 and 5. Okay. Uh, Seems he's a from from what I've seen, he's a stand up guy, bit of a karate style, you know. Starts to hold his hand out to sort of feel the range and start in and out sort of thing. Quite explosive. But we've got a game plan in uh, in place and tend to pretty much stick to the same plan every single fight and when we get the job done. So, you know, looking forward to get back in there since my injury. Yeah, I mean Obviously, you've had that um, that injury. How's that? How's that recovering now? Um, yeah, it's all right. I've only had one one sort of incident where I thought I'd rebroke it. Uh, just in just in sparring, I've been wrestling, everything, no no issues. Um, and then I was just sparring, and um, another one of our guys just threw a strike, and I sort of just blocked it. But he, uh, there's, there's, where are we? there's the scar. Really nicely, but he caught me right on the plate with this, um, just with a, I think it was an uppercut, and literally met me whole arm just went numb. Yeah. Uh, and I was just like, oh, I thought he just like hit it, um, shook it off. It was like the last round of sparring anyway, so just carried on for like the last minute or so. And then, uh, yeah, gradually just got worse, and then driving home from 
Colchester starting to have a drive through I did and my arm was just getting worse and worse. I couldn't hold the steering wheel. And then by the time I got home, I couldn't even raise my arm. I thought I'd, you know, retract it again or dislodge the plate or something. So, you know, a little bit worried, but sort of a couple of painkillers. A few hours later, it started to ease off. And since then, I've had no, no problems. Because obviously, it's never going to be how it should be. Um, yeah. But just doing what, doing what I can with it. It's not holding back. I'm not thinking about it during, during the fighting or sparring. Mm. It's one of the things, if it's going to break, it's going to break again, isn't it? It can't, it can't be helped. Yeah, no. it's one of those things, isn't it? Like with um, those kind of serious injuries, uh, the, those breaks. And ironically, your last fight was against Tom Mearns, one of Danny's fighters, who has had a similar thing. I suffered a really brutal injury. And then it's difficult then, isn't it? Because... Yeah, it's the fighting game. So fighters are gonna, you know, they're gonna test it out. They're gonna want to see how you cope with it and how you yeah, how you react to taking strikes and stuff to it. Um, like Danny, from your point of view as a coach, how do you deal with like, you know, as uh, someone coming back from a like a serious break? Yeah, well, a lot of it's down on to them because I'm not having the injury in my throat. Um, I, I can get my best I can to try to help with rehabilitation and uh, you know to, to help them be sensible with their approach coming back in. Um, you yeah, can. it's down to them. It's not a question. It's actually going to be in terms of trying to get into training. So I, I try to protect my time and try and train sensibly. So, Steve, like in terms of um, like how you were recovered from your injury and stuff, how did your coaches help you out with that? Like the, you know, like the rehab and then initially going back into training and stuff like that. Uh, to be fair, I sort of just deal with it all myself in a sense, sort of thing. I took quite a while off. I think. Um, I think after the injury, what was the injury was like for December, and I think I had almost might have been even like three months off, mm. been no nothing, just getting it done, and then sort of I think he got to about sort of eight or nine weeks out, and Jack was just like, "Are you, are you, do you want to fight on this?" No, it's a lie. That's a, that is a lie. I was I was asked to fight um, the new signing um, Harilla, Cage Warriors guy. Yeah. It's just been obviously we turned it down because of, because of my arm, but would have liked that fight. Would have been a good fight. Um, obviously went on for a, a good win, stopping Aiden Stevens. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we turned that one down, and um, I still hadn't done no training the on even coming up to that. And then like ten weeks out, and sort of was just like, yeah, I want to. I'm ready to go in sort of June, and just straight back to it. No. No sort of anything specific. I, I healed up and obviously back into the sparring and the, the wrestling and everything. Just, just taking it easy. I'm very aware of it. Um, so, you know, taking down sort of. I'm not posting that on my hand too much, just in case. It's always in the back of my head, thinking about it. But it's one of them. Just I tend to just sort of just get straight back to it. Mm. Was there ever a time? Was there a time, Steve, when you thought that, that might have ended your career? Um, when it first happened, I did. Like, and the nurse was just when I was in the A&E, she was like, oh, you, "You're not going to be fighting again." And uh, you, you obviously just like, "Yeah, I will. Don't worry about it." And then, um, you know, the wife is like, oh, "You can't be doing this anymore because self-employed now, running my own sort of." eating business and it's one of the things bills are more important at the end of the day and if if I can't do the you know if I can't work because my fighting is you know messing me up it's that was playing in the back of your mind but I'm not I'm not ready yet I'll, I've, I've always said I'll, I'll finish when I'm not able to compete uh, I'm not just going to be someone sort of punch bag and I'm still competing with the you know the best in the division so there's not nah it, Crossed my mind for about a second, and that was it. Straight out the door, thinking about the next. Because mm. that, that, that's quite interesting with what you're saying. What, what, 
I, I presume your intention is to be USB. That seems to be where everyone is. Um, yeah. You know, if you got that great, what, how would that work? Would you carry on your business? Or you know, would you put everything in for That's the thing. It, I've said this for a long time. If I, if I could afford to sort of commit 100% to it, then I would. Um, who would want to, you know, do something they, they love doing, they're passionate about, sort of, as a job, every day sort of thing, not having to, you know, worry about the bills. But obviously, if it did happen, it would be, you know, I'd have, you you got to give it 100%, can you? That opportunity may never ever come around. Um, but I would still have to try and work it around my full time job. The sure. Yeah, it's it's a hard hard decision, decision in it. You sort of you put yourself in the you're sort of in the middle. Do you do you follow you know what you've been doing for sort of ten twelve years? Um, finally get that break, or do you sort of hold it off because you know your, your family sort of thing is if, if you go one way you're gonna you might regret it and if you go the other way then you might think oh what ifs and then you're sort of always going to be in the back of yeah 100 percent it's um it's a weird thing oh, steve last fight you fought tom so before we move on i did want to just get your thoughts on that fight obviously as a fan it was a fantastic fight to watch, but uh, just tell us a bit about what it was like as a fight. Yeah, um, so I always knew it was going to be a good fight. Me and Tom have got um, history. We've, we've fought before in amateur days and known him and his brother throughout the MMA, so I've seen for since pretty much that I've been training. Um, and I always, you know, when I've been fighting for my pro career and Tom's been fighting, um, I've always fought to myself you know he's probably gonna end up coming around again that we end up fighting each other and um he called me out once before but i was due for my title fight and then obviously after my couple of losses um sort of just just made sense really tom was on some losses i was on some losses knew it would be a good fight and you know it it turned out to be a good fight i i, I said to tom that i would have you know, just for the fans and, you know, just for, just for like even better fight for it to have gone a little bit longer. But, mm. you know, I'm glad it didn't. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was, it, it had the potential to be, you know, like an even better fight than what it already was. So, yeah. yeah another, another fighter which you fought uh, of Danny's, who is obviously now the current featherweight champion is Jordan Vucenic. Uh, yeah. He's obviously been on the show a couple of times, friend of the channel, but like, I wanted to get your opinion on what you how like how you rate him as a fighter. Obviously, he's the current champion and stuff, but he's very highly rated in the MMA world in MMA media. I just kind of from, from a fighter's point of view, wondered what you thought of him. Um, before sort of we fought, didn't really obviously names flicking about a bit, but I'm not one to sort of. You know, follow other fighters and sort of just mm. stick to my own sort of thing and then just do what I need to do. But, um, you know, good all round. I didn't think I, during the fight, I didn't expect him to, you know, take me down, to be fair. Um, and that's probably why I did it. I did allow the, the, the takedown. So, I mean, I just weren't expecting it and uh, caught me off guard. But no no disrespect to Jordan, but mm. I, I feel I, I lost that fight myself sort of thing I didn't I didn't feel feel I lost because he was you know better than me on the day than yes but um, you know it was bloody razor close it was so it was close you close know fight. different different judges on the night you never you never know could have gone my way um, unfortunately it didn't but you know it's it, it, good all round his striking's good his wrestling's good um, don't think we've seen much of his jiu-jitsu game at the moment um cage wise just because he hasn't needed to do it yet but yeah. you know so you can't argue he's he's come in he's done what he's needed to do um and fair play to him do you think um is that something which you've got your eyes on again at some point is the title uh, featherweight title 
yeah, yeah, of course. That's, do you know what I mean? That's that's my division. Um, been there for a, a long time, and I want to get back up there. You know, since that fight with Mads and those two like razor close losses, I feel that everyone's just sort of forgetting about me, Cage Warriors as well, sort of thing. It's like I'm just uh, their their sort of feeder fighter for mm. all these new signings, um, which you know it pisses me off a bit. Um, Does that give you the the kind of the drive not, sort of thing? Yeah, the itch and the that like you said there, it pisses you off. Like for me, yeah. if I like, I'm just looking at it from the outside, obviously, and for what you've just said. But like, if I'm pissed, if I'm in your situation and I'm feeling a bit pissed off, dare I say, like a little bit disrespected, that's gonna drive me to make a point. Do you know what I mean? Like the next yeah. next fight, do you feel like you'd like to go in there and kind of really make a point. Yeah, it, it's not a point. It's not as if making a point to to cage warriors or sort of things like that. But it's just more of a Reminder. to show that I'm, I'm still relevant, sort of thing. Don't over, don't start o overlooking me because I've had, you know, those two losses on the bounce. Um, do you know what I mean? All, all these new guys that come up and they're everyone's like, oh, they're the you know next best thing, or oh, they're this, they're that, they're this and that, and you know they haven't they haven't done anything yet. It's just sort of all previous five seven sort of done anything in cage wars or anything that's really sort of wow. Um, mm. And then you have got myself sort of things been in there a while. I had my, my win streak, fought Mads. Do you know what I mean? All this lot, and then sort of two, you know, two super close losses, and it's like you're, you're thrown back to the bottom of the pile. Yeah. It's just like what you got to do, do you know what I mean? Um, so, <laughs> it's uh, it, yeah, it's a uh, it's a doggy dog yeah, it, business, yeah, you know what I mean? and it's, I think it's a business at the end of the day, isn't it? It's difficult. We had a question sent in from um, Gaz for both you guys, and I'd be interested in the answer because obviously two different generations in terms of f fighting. But I'd be interested. So, Danny, I'm going to throw it to you first. Uh, he says, in your opinion. Who is the greatest all-round fighter who's ever fought in Cage Warriors as a regular? Uh, other than myself. Um... No, no, you can include yourself, mate. <laughs> if you truly believe that you are the best, you can have yourself in there, mate. Yeah, but um, I think, well... All-round fighter. It's really... That's a really hard one to answer, to be honest, because... In the modern arena, there's so many very well-rounded individuals and so, so hard to pick one over any other in the modern day. But, you know, so I'm really going to answer it on a bit of a retro way. I, I think it's one of the first people who are really well-rounded, who is a big impact on Cage War, is probably a guy called Martin Kempman. Okay. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, I think he's a Swedish guy. He went on to UFC. Um yeah, so I, I would say he's one of the first ones that really showed that he can, you know, strike at world class, can, can wrestle it up good time, and, and had good jujitsu skills. Um, but there, that's 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 a really hard one to answer in the modern day world. Um, so many well complete guys. Um, I, I, I would want to stick to my own and say Jordan. Um, yeah. And and Steve's right. Jordan's not really got to express his grappling, and all I can say is he can grapple, and. Mm. and He's just been so efficient on his feet and in his anti-wrestling and scrambling back up to his feet that he's not got to express that. <clears throat> but there will be times when he's going to put it to the ground and keep it to the ground just because that strategy and that tactic suits that situation. You will see his ground at some at some stage. But I see it as this. You you start MMA on the feet, so you want to make sure you're really, really proficient and good there. And Jordan certainly that. The next thing is if you're getting outplayed on the feet, you want to be able to steer this fight into another arena, either up against the cage or down on the map. You've got to be able to get it there. And likewise, if you're winning on the feet, you need to avoid the ground because you know full well if you're up against a, a good opponent with a good team, they'll be strategizing to get you down in the following rounds. Yeah, um, sure. He's got everything in place to address every situation. So, you know, of course, I'm, I'm going to be steering a little bit biased on that. Anyone? Uh, is there anyone else who you'd have up there in terms of complete fighters that springs to mind off the top of your head? 
Is that um, something else? Just, yeah, yeah. To I just wondered if there was any uh, any if you had any more other than the two that, uh, sprung, that sprung to mind, mate. Really, like yeah. I mean, I mean, we we could just go. I mean, Paul Hughes. You know, again, I'm, I'm picking on the the, the featherweight divisions here because it's relevant to to see. Ever. I think Paul Hughes is extremely complete. He, he showed very very strong grappling prowess, great wrestling, counter wrestling, and an and attacking wrestling, and he can strike some as well. I mean, he truly is. Uh, an incredible athlete at such a young age and um, someone that's got massive future um, regardless of what what's happened in the past uh, mm. between him and Jordan another one that's just so so talented and, and all well rounded yeah 100% mate I think um, that guy, for me Paddy Pimblett's got to be in there within the, in the conversation for the most all round uh, one of the best all round fighters that's been in Cage Warriors like we've talked about in recent days mate uh, in recent shows like he hasn't really got many holes in his game like so i think he'd be in the conversation um jordan yeah i could see jordan it's difficult with jordan because like you said he hasn't shown or hasn't been hasn't needed to show certain skills so to rate him as one of the best all-round fighters that has been in cage warriors i find that difficult as much as i would like to because i like him a lot but what about you, Steve? Like, who, who, what sort of names would spring to mind um, for you? Jack Shaw. Yes, that's a that's a good shout. Yeah, I think that's a um, good shout. You know, it's, it's just complete all round, isn't he? Just uh, every time he's in there, sort of thing. Just got he just made everything just everything looked easy for him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. Just. Um, he's almost got the opposite problem of Jordan though he just got people down so easy we never really got to yeah. see his striking did we but yeah, what we see now in UFC he can he can strike and we know he can strike yeah. but you know we don't get to showcase that as much as the other skill sets he's got because he's just so no, proficient of steering it's, it where he wants to put it that's the thing it's everyone who's so good now it's like it's just fine margins between every, it could just be like a little slip on the floor or a slip on your feet and, you know, you've lost that round because, you know, someone's taking you down for three and a half minutes, controlled you there. It's just, everyone's just so right, right, so well-rounded. It's just such a a chess game, which can lead to boring fights um, mm. or it, it can just be, you know, just classic, but uh, agreeing with Danny, like Paul Hughes, you know, just, um, yeah. just, you know, well rounded again, um, you know. Since that, since his finish, I think might have been his, his first fight in cage. Where he's obviously got that head kick finish, and uh, obviously he hasn't managed to get any finishes since then. And uh, coming off that loss against Jordan, um, again another razor close fight. Um, just, just so many people up there that you, you could say are oh, like Danny said. Um, this person and that person, but again, it's it's hard to it is hard to pick one. It's hard to split people, isn't it? To be fair. And I think, particularly in the modern day, um, everyone has got like this superb all round game. Whereas Danny, I'm sure you'd agree. Like back in your day, there was a lot of fighters who were exceptional strikers or exceptional grapplers or exceptional wrestlers, but they maybe weren't as good in other areas. Whereas now most fighters are good at everything they might be more proficient at something but they're generally good at everything and like you said there steve about a slip and you can lose the round but i think yeah. if you think back to the um the show before the first lockdown that cage warriors did when um mason won his won the title and um paddy pimblett fought so i forget who it was but that person i think he like he made a really really slight error and uh, Paddy had kind of mounted him and submitted him in sort of 15 seconds and yeah. I think that's what you're talking about with the very top level of the various divisions in Cage Warriors like we've discussed on recent shows Steve like that Cage Warriors in our opinion is almost like the second best promotion in the world certainly yeah. you know, but it's not even just a European thing now because the level is so high that like yeah, these guys who are going from Cage Warriors into the UFC, you're looking at them and you're thinking, 
if they put them in with ranked fighters like a Jack Shaw or a Paddy Pimblett or whoever it may be, you, you, you're thinking they can go and do something in the UFC. Um, I think yep. that level is so high with you guys now that it's, um, you make it a slight error and you can be, never mind losing a round, you, you could be knocked out, submitted or whatever in 30 seconds. Yeah, and um, just say like you're at the top of the division, you have your, you know, a top fight, you lose that fight and having that one loss trying to get back to that same position can be so hard because it's not as if you're just stepping back in at, you know, being the best one, one fight and you're back at the title shot. You're stepping back, you're stepping back in there against, you know, a, a complete row of guys, you know, that are one step ahead of you now, um, but up the ladder and it could take you four or five fights to get back to where you were. It's not as if you're just one fight and you're back to where you was. It, it can be, you know, it can take years off your your career where you were, sort of thing. Just because it's so hard to get back. Yeah, it's like a death row of, uh, of fighters, yeah. cage warriors. Is, you're right, and and like you say, yeah, if you get that, like whether it be a title shot or like a number one contender shot or whatever, if you lose it, yeah, you are. You're right. You sort of there's at least three or four guys then you've got to go through to just get back to the level that you were at before, which is incredible for, you know, for fans and things, but it just makes it a very cutthroat division and, and, and company. That, that's what we want. We're not there to, you know... Yeah, you don't want to pad your fight record, do you? You'd rather have proper fights. You, we want to fight, you know, top fights and the, the top fighters. You want to you test yourself. You want to be the best. Um, so it it is good and it's bad, you know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I, one thing I wanted to talk about, Steve, is um, your start in MMA and martial arts. Like, how old were you when you started to go was, down that route? One, when I started. started was it? Yeah. Wow. Oh, good video. Um, I've been 13 years now. I've been doing this. CSM. Been pro for, I think. Yeah, nine years in November, I've been pro, something like that. Who was um, who were the early influences on you in terms of when it went from maybe like when you started to look in towards turning pro? Who were the guys who kind of influenced you and helped you along and on your journey and progressing? Um, like it was sort of the Matthews and sort of you know all those type of guys back in the day then. That really got me like excited and wanted to give it a go, mm. um, and then when getting in there, just I, I wasn't. I've never been one to sort of follow, you know, watch watch other fighters and like, oh, I want to be like them. So it, it, that is a hard question for me. I'm sort of self self driven sort of thing. Yeah. I'll if if I do if I sort of try something, I I just sort of dedicate myself to it and just try and be you know as, as good as I can so it's, it is hard to sort of name a name a fighter that I thought oh yeah I really like them I want to do it mm. I, just, I just liked like watching it in, in general no one really stuck out stuck but up. what about yeah. what about like influences on you personally as you went as you did turn sort of from amateur to pro um, yeah. like whether it be coaches or just friends or whoever it may be, was there people who were sort of really advising you and helping you on that journey? Or again, was it more like self-driven with a bit um, of help? Again, mainly self-driven, but I, my, my first coach like that got me into, into the fighting. Um, just, just, you know, just pushing me. Oh, you, you can do it. You, you know, you can, you're going to go far sort of thing, just giving you that, that self-confidence. Mm. Um, Ashley Wynn, his name was. Um, just, yeah, it just made me self-driven. Just uh, once I've got a, a thing on my head sort of thing, that's it, I'm, I'm so stubborn. I'll just, I'll just <laughs> go for it sort of thing. It's, yeah. it's good and it's bad. Um, but, yeah, just that's one of them things for me. Sounds, just, um, 
sorry mate sounds like you no, sounds like you're quite like uh, quite an independent person and quite self, yeah, very. self-motivated is that in all aspects of your life or is that more like a yeah. fighting thing yeah all, all aspects of my life to be fair my wife hates it she <laughs> really, really really does um but yeah all aspects of my life like when i first found out we were we were having our first child sort of thing i was working away all the time and then i was just like right i'm quitting my job i'm doing a gas course and that was it <laughs> and no yeah just quit my job wife's like five six months pregnant um yeah no Big money steps. coming in the ha- no money coming in the house and you're like you start to question yourself well have you done the right thing but you know it's eight two years on it's, it's the best thing i've ever done um i wish i'd done it sooner so yeah self-driven every every aspect of my life don't like being told anything um yeah it's <laughs> that's just <me. laughs> what um what's your favorite part of fighting whether it be like the striking, the wrestling, or like what what do you love to get stuck into the most on like a um, daily basis or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I do love I do love to stand up and sort of the, the wrestling side. I've never really been a ground guy, um, not because I can't or anything like that. I just just love to strike and wrestle. Really, it's just getting getting punched in the face. Mm-hmm. It, it, it gets you going, sort of thing. That's that's for sure. Um, <laughs> it, it, there's no, it's just no better, no better feeling, and, and just just competing for me. Just, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all, pretty much just the stand up and the wrestling up. That's always been me, really. That's always been my go to, mm. um, and the jujitsu if I've needed to. But I've never really needed to, to be fair. What about um, like training during COVID? Was that difficult? Or was it not too bad because you were recovering from an injury? Yeah, it was. It was difficult in the fact, obviously, we had to same with everyone, just try and work around it. We um, just set up mats in Jack's back garden, sort of in a, in a gazebo, just training there in, in the mornings, um, in the evening sometimes, just just mainly self-training you know mm. just keeping you going and then getting in as just as much as you can i didn't really do too much over the lockdown although i i fought in all three of the the lockdown shows i believe the first three um in between the fights so i was sort of just laying off spending time with the family and then when you fight when i'm finding out there's another show coming up that's when i sort of get motivated get going again yeah um, I am, I've always been a little bit lazy between shows uh, between fight camps but it's worked so far so just keep it going it has indeed like and Danny like is one of the my favourite one I say one of my favourite things but I am always interested in hearing the different guests we've had on uh, just talk about like how they got around not around but like how they dealt with the COVID restrictions and how they were able to still train. And we still haven't had one fighter yet say, well, I couldn't train, so I didn't. They all found a way to do something and do it, you know, do as much as they could. And I think that's testament to why the level is so high in the UK is because the fighters are so dedicated. But it is interesting, isn't it, to hear different people's experiences Mm -hmm. from that period because, you know, it's difficult and unprecedented thing as well yeah these young men they they want it you know at the end of the day they want to be successful in the sport that they're dedicating to so you know it holds no surprises for me that they're finding ways to still train and keep fit and you know like steve's said that he's very self-motivated anyway as an individual um i think this is something that was quite strong with myself during my fight career you know choosing to go out and run on a cold winter's morning when it's raining um, you know, to keep the weight off and, and obviously to continue to maintain fitness, etc. Um, you know, you, where there's a will, there's a way. There's no other stronger adage, really. You, you, you've got to you've got to keep going. It's the survival of the fittest, and that was a real hard time and unprecedented time for many. But most found a way around it. The, the ones that want to want to succeed the most, they find a way. Simple as that, really. 
Hundred percent, mate. Um, so, Steve, what I want to do now is it's basically like a you got to. I'm going to say five fighters, and I want you to say the first word that comes to mind when I say their name, whatever it may be. Um, no swearing. No, oh, you can swear all you want, man. Come on, <laughs> Jesus. Um, I'm going to have to stuff like this. No, you can yeah. just I literally. Know, He's putting you on the spot here. No, putting you on the spot. Just, it's like those quick fire questions we've done before, Dan. It's just uh, I'm going to do it to Danny now as well, so don't worry about it. Um, oh. So it's just just the first word that comes to mind, mate. Doesn't have to be you know anything. <laughs> could be whatever you want. Um, so first name Jake Paul. <laughs> Joker. <laughs> Joker. That's fine. That's good. Uh, Conor McGregor. Moneymaker. Tony Ferguson. Crazy. Da Danny Button. <laughs> Legend. Say it. Say it. <laughs> uh, and then last one, Corey McKenna. Beast. There we go. Um, all right, then, Danny, you'll go, mate. And we've got... Uh, Lee Remedios. Lee, oh my goodness. Um, trash talker. He's just a trash talker. Trash talker. Um, George St. Pierre. Genius. Jake Paul. Cock. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I forgot his name. Uh, Edson Barboza. <clears throat> Scary. And um, then the final one is Francis Ngannou. Oh, even more scary. <laughs> <laughs> the absolute beast. <laughs> Bright, frightening. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say Michael Chandler for you, but I didn't want to upset you after he lost last week. I thought you might start crying and stuff. So Yeah, I was going to say let down. <laughs> don't want to do, do upset you. But, I um, wanted him to win. Yeah, Danny, Danny's got a bit of a man crush on Michael Chandler, you see. I don't know what it is, but there's something about Mr. Chandler which Danny likes, but I could eat. I, a little thing about Chandler, um, when I was out in Bellator, uh, mm. when I got talking with him, I got him to sign some gloves, because the, the Mernseys both love it, love Chandler as well. Um, you know, when you talk about fighters that have an influence, <clears throat> Tom Mearns in particular really loves Chandler's style. Yeah. And um, I got him some gloves personally signed. By Chandler for him, and I think he actually fought his, his work ethic as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you know he's not a young man anymore. We, we're noticing that as soon as people sort of like hit to mid thirties to succeed at the very, very top, top level. When you think of someone like Ferguson, they're now sort of like dropping out. He's kept yeah. himself in physical, amazing shape. You know, that's a man that's clearly dedicated to his training. Yeah, yeah hundred percent, sure. mate. I'm. Um, I'd be very interested what Tony Ferguson does next. To be honest, because he should retire. Simple he should, really. I don't think I don't think he's going to admit. Um, mm. But we'll see. That's it's going to be one. yeah. It's going to be interesting for sure. Um, yeah. Steve, last uh, lastly, I just wanted to say um, sorry about the technical issues that we had uh, no, earlier on. We've kind of cobbled together about three different videos now, which will be <laughs> it'll all result in a nice forty-five minute chat. But a patchwork. Yeah, I'm very good at that. <laughs> I gotta be because Danny's internet is not very really good. It must be like a Northampton thing. I think they don't end. They're still on, <laughs> still on dial up, still on dial up. Um, but uh, very lastly, mate, what um, like where do you want to be in three years' time? In twenty twenty four, where do you want to be? Oh, God, um, in the perfect world. That three years, I'll be I'll be pushing thirty seven by then. <laughs> um, take take my career as you know. I just want to, you know, just keep pushing that career, and obviously, just get as, uh, get as high as I can. I, I doubt I'll still be fighting at thirty seven. Um, okay. So I've either made it by then or I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thirty seven. I'd just like to, you know, just. 
be happy with everything I've I've accomplished, whether I am still fighting or I'm not. I don't want to be, you know, looking back and all those what ifs. Just I just want to be happy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Happy with my yeah. family. Um, I've got another little get another little baby on the way, so you know, family life's starting to take over. And <laughs> just as long as I'm happy, and my family's happy and healthy. Um, that's where I want my life to be in in three years' time. Just where I am now, but happier. Cannot mm. fault you, mate. That's, uh, that's, I'll, that's, I'll, I'll just say one thing, you know, just to done. finish up on, um, you know, when you're saying about that, you know, if you feel that when you have a loss, you've got such a big sort of like crawl back to recognition sort of yeah. thing. But I think sometimes that's a little bit of a perception and it's just what you yeah. feel and perceive it to be. And indeed, maybe cage warriors do treat people like that. You've had a loss suddenly, you're, you're sort of like out of contention quite quickly. Yeah. But, you know, on a personal note, um, you know, you fought a, a few of my lads. I think you fought Rick Salivari. He's now come over to us. I've been training with him yeah. for the last sort of year and a half, two years. Yeah. Um, if you obviously fought Tom Mans, you fought um, Jordan. And when we were talking about, you know, what Jordan's going to do next after winning his title and who we think he should fight next and who we think should have a fight off to get an opportunity to fight him, you know, your name was never out of that loop. Um, you know, you, you're, no, you're someone that... The, the, the whole group or certainly from our club perspective anyway you're very very highly touted and, and quite possibly out of the last three fights that Jordan's have and had you were the one that posed more questions and evolved his game more than any of the others did in fact I don't think Jordan would have been able to beat Hughes if he hadn't experienced you beforehand because we had to put some wrongs right after experiencing being in there with you so you know don't don't hold your head down but by, by any stretch, um, yeah, no, still absolutely great. relevant in terms of the fighters, very, very well respected, and I'm sure we're going to see further success from yourselves. No, I appreciate that, Danny. Thank you, mate. Yeah, no worries, Steve. I couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more. And I got to say as well, um, I, one last question from me, mate. I would like to know after you mentioned like you won't be fighting in three years' time, or you don't think you will be. What about? What would, is there anything that you'd like to do? So not necessarily just coaching. Could you see yourself doing anything else within the sport uh, after you retire, whether it's a bit of refereeing, commentating, anything like that, which kind of you think you'd like to try your hand at? I don't know. I, might, I think I would probably, if I was to carry on, more st maybe steer towards the refereeing sort of side. I've never really been a coacher sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've got the patience for it, to be honest. Um, but maybe a bit more towards the reference side because I'm still still getting in there sort of thing. You're still experiencing it. But who knows, you know, I might finish fighting and sort of fall in love with the coaching side. Um, but, yeah, I would say more maybe towards the, the reference side, the reference side of the game. Good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Steve? been an absolute pleasure to have a chat to you mate no, and uh, please, you're welcome back anytime mate and obviously uh, we don't normally have this amount of technical issues so i don't know quite what's <laughs> going on today but uh, i appreciate your patience mate and uh no thank you top man see you soon and uh of course me and danny are staying on now to talk uh last night's ufc bit of bellator uh, a historic boxing event as well uh, which took place last night with uh, a undisputed world champion from Britain, uh, Danny. First time ever, mate. That's uh, quite the achievement, well, isn't it? Cheers, uh, cheers, Steve. Yeah, well, Steve, awesome. Cheers, buddy. Enjoy Stay in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, just totally, it did amazing. Um, it did do amazing. Um, I didn't watch the whole fight. What I did was I went through the highlights, and, um, and there was a lot of them. Mm. Um, both of them really took it to each other. I think stylistically... Uh, Ramirez likes to take it and get in close and get tucked in and Josh Taylor was really responding well um, it's that uppercut it was just beautiful Dude, and the fact those opposite stances as well made it a really interesting contest um, but what an amazing feat and, and done so classily you know getting a knockdown as well I thought it was all over um, I really did at some points but yeah really 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 good to watch yeah it was a really enjoyable fight I thought Ramirez looked you know, he's a really epic, uh, almost like a stereotypical Mexican fighter. Tough, quick, strong, and, and just will not stay down. No, I mean, like I say, I, I thought it was over numerous times. 
and then uh, Ramirez comes straight back and started getting some successes of his own. Um, it was impressive performance on both parts, to be fair. Um, but Josh Taylor, wow, you know, those left hands, mate, one that, that Josh Taylor was throwing were doing some real damage. Is the um, way he prepped it up. He just kept on getting it through the guard. Um, it's not easy to hit super clean when you're wearing those big boxing gloves, you know, but he's yeah. up in the guard. Lovely. It was his decision making, um, on the dime. You, you have to be quick thinking. You have to, you know, have preconceived sequences put into your game. Mm. So, you know, that's also hats off to, you know, he's coaching uh, as well because uh, you could just see some things were just set off on, onto automatic mode. He was just triggering and going and and making success of it very often in there. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I have been a huge fan of boxing over the years and did come away from it for many years through frustrations, which I think a lot of people experience with boxing. But when you see performances like that and being a, a UK performance as well, um, was uh, really igniting my interest again. I actually really enjoyed watching it. Um, it's a fight that, because I watched the highlights, it's you know inspired me to actually go back and um, when I've got more relaxing time to digest and watch the, the full fight and enjoy it a little bit more full-heartedly. Yeah, 100%. Those shots, which he, he knocked him down twice and they're both times so clean, so quick. Really yeah. good shots. But you mentioned the frustration with boxing. Um, we've literally seen that this week whereby they announced Tyson Fury was finally fighting uh, Andy Joshua. And literally, like, two days later, there's uh, the WBO or whichever one it was. Um, not that, so there was a, an arbitration going on because uh, Deontay Wilder is the mandatory number one contender even though he's lost technically to Tyson Fury twice he drew one uh, and, and it's ridiculous yeah. uh, so they've it really ordered, is. Um, Tyson Fury has to fight um, Deontay Wilder I think it was before September so he's now fighting him on the 24th of July and Joshua has been ordered to fight uh, Usk for his the WBO title but it's just like this is why people get so frustrated from boxing and then why people like me and you yourself we've, we've kind of drifted away from it over the years because like we'll watch the big fights and stuff like that but as a weekly thing or a, a, a regular thing you drift away from it because one thing which MMA does better than boxing no matter if boxers get paid more and all you know they may do more pay-per-views or whatever MMA pits the best versus the best absolutely and I think it would be less complex to do a joint Bellator and UFC show than it would to get some of these fighters to fight each other. And yeah. that is a problem. Like, that's ridiculous. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, that Bellator and UFC are going to do a show, but I think that there's probably less hassle to organising that than there is to getting some of these fights on because there's so many people involved and companies involved and it's it's infuriating mate because everyone in the world wants to see tyson fury fight anthony joshua they yeah. want to fight each other just do it yeah like, so you know what's going to happen they're going to end up probably fighting each other when they're in their 40s or something well, crazy fury like that it's not just... young as it is is he i don't i'm not saying he's old but like he's not getting younger is he and no. this is the other issue isn't it mm -hmm. tyson fury's 32 which, yeah, you know, it's not old, but it is in that, for fighting point of view, 32, 33 is almost like the start of the decline yeah. in, a lot, in a lot of fighters. Now, yeah. Tyson Fury is not a lot of fighters. He is, you know, he's one of the best ever. He's a phenomenal fighter, but he is also six foot seven or something stupid, whatever six it is. Six nine, I think he is. Six nine. He's massive, Huge. isn't he? So I, that has an, that has a, an effect on your body over time because you're carrying so much weight around so much height yep. around the pressure on the back and the neck and the joint excuse me the joints is um like that does have an effect and he's getting to that age where it will start to have an effect um yeah six foot nine jesus he's a big boy yeah but um, hopefully they just get a fight. And but the other problem is now they've made them do these fights. Like us, Joshua should beat us pretty comfortably. But mm. 
heavyweights, mate. We've seen with Joshua before got knocked out mm. by that Mexican Ruiz. Yeah. Like it can happen. Yeah. Deontay Wilder, on the other hand, is like I yes, Tyson Fury has knocked him out and he's outboxed him and they drew, which he should have won. Mm. I get that. But Deontay Wilder has got the power that he could knock Tyson Fury out. Yeah. And then yeah. you lose like Tyson you lose Fury that versus yeah. Joshua's uh, not there then. It's doing nothing but harm in boxing. Yeah. Just uh, harms it. Really uh, yeah. on, on the British front, mate, uh, Bellator on Friday, the Brits did not have a enjoyable evening. No, they didn't. Um, I you know, One of the fights that I didn't see was Brett Johns. I didn't see that, unfortunately. Um, but I did see uh, Edwards, Fabian Edwards. He actually performed really, really well, but he was fighting a really, really tough wrestler. And um, I, I, you know, I was hearing in the commentary that, you know, Fabian really wanted to test himself up against a real hardcore wrestler. And yeah, he, he got what he wanted. And yeah, this, this, this Vanderford, he's very, very persistent. Um, the way he was getting Edwards down was really, really clever. Um, mm. The thing with Edwards, he, he's got fantastic striking. He actually started a little quicker than he normally does. He's been criticized for starting slow. <clears throat> looking super sh sharp out in the open with his freestyle wrestling defense. But he quite often made mistakes with his footwork that ended up getting put with his back against the fence with the wrestler tucked underneath his um, belt line. And it was just pulling his feet away from the fence. And um, yeah, and, and, and then uh, Vanford being that he's such a good wrestler, started to figure out how to get at Fabian out in the open on the freestyle. He was going in on the knee. And sort of like doubling and tripling up his his entries once he made connection. Um, yeah, it was impressive what he did really because Fabian looked super sharp in really really good shape. Um, always da dangerous on the feet. He looked like he could could put the fight away at any time. But Vanderford, good wrestling. What can what can you say? You know he honed, he earned his victory well. He, he played it very very smart. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. Um, and then you've obviously got Brett um, Johns. Uh, making his bad at all debut, it didn't go to plan. Um, to use uh, one of your terms, mate, he got wrestle screwed. Um, just bear with me a second. Sorry, mate. That's right, buddy. Um, yeah, he got wrestle screwed, mate. Um, Sabaletto, I think his name was. Um, right. He looked. He was making his debut as well. Uh, actually, I thought he looked very good. Um, Sabaletto. Brett just. He didn't look himself. I gotta say. Um, like when you think back to those last two fights he had in the UFC, Brett looked exceptional. Like um, mm. that gravity fight was his first fight back one minute after a long yeah. layoff, and he looked so good. Um, mm. And he just didn't didn't look himself but you know there could be reasons and i think he'll go away and he's not going to shy away from it he'll come back and he'll take on all comers but what it does show is that bellator over the last 18 months have made they've strengthened their division because if you remember when me and you when brett first signed months and months ago we looked at that division and we were like yeah brett johns is better than a lot of these guys but mm. then they've brought in a lot of new faces. Daniel Sabaletto yep. is one of them. And he did a good job of negating what Brett Johns is good at. Um, and that's what it's about, is having a game plan to defeat your opponent. Even if it's not the best to watch, it's about doing that. Uh, one person who did have a good evening, however, mate, was Leah McCourt. Uh, okay. Now, she is the real deal. Uh, I'm very interested to see what's next for her because she's uh, she's rank seven, rank play, uh, fighting rank six. Uh, she defeated Janai Hardin uh, via a triangle choke about two and a half minutes into the second round. Right. Um, but the end of the fight came about. Uh, Liam McCourt's on the floor, and you look. It looks as if she might be in a bit of trouble, and um, in the blink of an eye. Uh, Hardin comes down as if she's going to go for some strikes and maybe try and get into the ground and pound and she nails her with an up kick 
flush on the chin. Oh, wow. And she crumples to her knees and she just brings her into a nice, nice head triangle and it's all wow. over. But, you know, she's ranked, Leah's ranked seven. Um, she's got some impressive wins on her record, some impressive finishes on her record. For me, she can't out be far off uh, those title fights, which, you know, that's going to be interesting because I think Leah McCaw, Leah McCaw has won five now since her professional right. debut. So, uh, she lost on a professional debut and she's won five on the bounce. Um, she's going to be ranked at least six in that division. So for me, how you know maybe one more fight and then you could be looking at a, a title shot. I think it's fair. Right. That's fair. Like if she wins another fight, that'll be six on the bounce. Like yeah, I think impressive. a lot of them, a lot of them are. Uh, I'm going to double check, but I think a lot of those are finishes as well, if not all. So like you know, what more does she need to do? Really, yeah. is would be my question, um, but it'll be interesting, mate. Uh, we can't uh, we can't not mention the main event of Bellator on Friday. Miss uh, mm, Cyborg was back. Yeah, what about it. Yeah, Cyborg. Um, this was really good to watch, and you know, also, can, you know, Leslie Smith just did fantastic to stay in there because you know she was really attacked by a, a seasoned cyborg and when i say seasoned it's like she's learnt from her mistakes she she still pushes a hard pace but she she holds a little something back she's being strategic she's being thoughtful about the the long haul of the fight and i think that really served her well but leslie smith you know she she stayed in there she took some big body shots she took some big leg kicks some big punches to her face and um some suplexes she really had the whole spectrum of MMA put on to her. And she was so close to the finish line. She just got stopped with so seconds left of that final fifth round. Um, but like I say, that it, it was just utterly impressive, really, what she was able to withstand and put up with and still come forward. She had no fears at facing Cyborg in any of the realms the fight was put in. But uh, she just looked physically and able to compete with Cyborg. Cyborg's so, so explosive. I, I, I don't want to sound insulting by saying so manly, but she has such man movements about yeah, the no, way I she goes about mean. her technique. You know, um, She's very aggressive as well, um, yeah, which you yeah, sometimes but, don't associate with female fighters. Yeah, but. exactly. But you know, I think she's someone that always has a clean life. She's always training. I think this is a real lifestyle, which I think, is why you're still still seeing her be so super effective her, uh slowly seasoning age you know she's no longer you know young anymore she's in the twilight years you would think of her career but shows no signs of slowing up okay yeah. she's got that one knockout that went against her on a record against nunez but against um, one of the greatest ever by the yeah, way yeah exactly yeah exactly that um it's just a, just a shame that we quite possibly will never see that run passed again because i'd love to see that fight again yeah and with the way cyborg fought leslie smith this time around is definitely uh, a cyborg that's adjusted her game to her previous experiences and i i would put my money on cyborg if she was to face nunes a, a second time but like i say it's one of those things that i just don't think we'll We'll see, unfortunately. Um, I know we talk about in MMA that, you know, the fights we want to see do get put on. But unfortunately, with the way things have gone, um, Cyborg was in UFC and now come out of UFC. Um, and it's not likely that Nunes would throw UFC in for Bellator. No. So, and the, um, on the flip side of that, it's not likely Cyborg's going to go back into UFC either. So, quite frustrating from her. For a, a UFC veteran for a next fight, though, she said she wants to fight Kat Zingano. Um, she said that's a fight that she's always wanted. She's never... Yeah, because um, Kat's... She's won, hasn't she? Um, I think one or yeah. two times in Bellator. Um, Cyborg historically fights twice a year, basically. Uh, yeah. Or twice a calendar year. So I think that to be may see Kat Singano. And I tell you what, if I'm Liam McCourt, I'm thinking, right, you fight Kat Singano, I'm going to go and win two more fights in that time. And then yeah. I want my title shot. She's yeah, got to be yeah. like, and she's got to be aiming for that. And I think if she can pull out the way Liam McCourt is going, if she can pull out two victories against, you know, the ranked 
three and fourth, whoever mm. they may be, because Bellator's rankings are impossible to find out. Although they did say they were going to change that, so I'm going to go and have a quick look. Um, and we'll see if we can actually get them. Um, but yeah, Liam Court, mate, I really think two fights, if she can win. Oh, Bellator rankings, they've worked it, mate. Looks like they've, wow. worked, they've actually got them sorted. <laughs> so, women's featherweights. So, we've got Chris Cyborg, champion, defeated Leslie Smith last night. Then you've got Julia Budd. Uh, Arlene Blen Clow uh, second, Kat Zingano third, Leslie Smith fourth, Sinead Kavanagh uh, five, and then Janae Hardin and then Liam McCourt. So I put to you this, mate. Liam McCourt's going to be up to at least six because she beat Janae Hardin. So then you're going to have uh, Liam McCourt of Northern Ireland six, Sinead Kavanagh of Republic of Ireland five. Uh, both on a fairly decent winning streak. Would you mm. pit them against each other, or would you look to pit, say, Sinead versus Blen Clow's rank two, and and put Liam McCourt versus a, a Leslie Smith? So yeah, like, I, Liam McCourt's the first woman to ever ha uh, headline a Bellator Europe card. By the way, she right. her last fight was then she headlined Bellator show. So right, that's excellent. They've obviously mm. got plans for her. Sure. And I look at those two ladies in Kavanaugh and McCourt, and I want to see them fighting Leslie Smith, Kat Zingano, yeah. Julia Budd, Chris Cyborg. Yeah, yeah. I want those fights for those girls because yeah. they deserve those fights. Yeah, so that Julia Budd, that, that, is that she's that really highly touted striker. She's yeah, got a big boxer. striking background. Very tall, I think. That's right. Um, and, uh, five yeah, eight. I think she, she's, she's going to be a handful for any of those girls in that division. Yeah, that she's, um, she's been very up and down, though, traditionally through her career in terms of mm -hmm. um, performance like and, and results, I think, right. is probably the fair way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, she lost to Cyborg. Cyborg is going to beat most women, I think. But mm -hmm. someone's going to beat her at the end of the day. Someone will, before Cyborg retires, in my opinion, someone else will beat her. Yeah, so why couldn't it be not, one of these Irish girls? <clears throat> yeah, it could well be. Yeah, so I not one of these people who are just gonna retire willy nilly. I think, like I said, I think it's a lifestyle for her. Yeah, I think she loves she herself. She, she could well, yeah, she could well find it hard to step aside. But if you actually listen to Cyborg or read any interviews that she's done, she's a pretty switched on lady. You know, she's she's not, you know, the typical stereotype fighting thinker. Mm -hmm. You know, she's actually very, very intelligent, as is for a lot of the fighters that are successful in the modern day. They're, they, they've got good IQs, you know, they're not stupid people. And she conducts herself ever so well in interviews, and she really knows what she's on. So I wouldn't be surprised if she, you know, does put a plan um, together on the way her career goes and when she steps aside. But I don't think she's going to step aside while she's winning. So Chris Cyborg... Julia Bird, five for eight, both of them. Liam Court, five for eight. Jeez, they're all you know, pretty tall. tall so I'm just yeah. checking Sinead Kavanagh's um height. I think she's a bit shorter if I remember correctly, but I'll just double check. Obviously she fights out of SBG uh Island. She's five foot six, so only you know, a couple right. of inches. Um mm. But yeah, it's gonna be fascinating watching those two Irish girls go at it. Um, yeah. Sinead Kavanagh did lose to um, Leslie Smith back at Bellator 224, but that's um, oh, quite a while ago, uh, mm. 2019. <clears throat> so she's come yeah. on, you know, she's won some fights since then. <clears throat> so it's going to be interesting, mate. I'm quite excited for that featherweight division in the Bellator. They've, yeah, they're getting it together they, there. Yeah, they, the, the women's female, uh, the female featherweight, division they've built quite a division on the sly like right. quietly without letting us know they've um, <laughs> we, you know, they don't promote themselves enough mate in my opinion like people still don't even realize that they're on bbc and i find that mind-blowing because mm -hmm. that's such a big deal for mma and yeah they just don't promote they're not promoting it enough for me mm -hmm. um and by the way i would absolutely if liam mccourt or sinead kavanagh was to see this 
I would absolutely love to get either girl on, both girls on, on the show to have a chat. Um, you should leave the sweet talking to me. I'll get them on. Oh, yeah, mate. Okay. <laughs> but, but I would like to get more female fighters on. Obviously, we had Corey McKenna yeah. on. Yeah, um, she was I'd brilliant. Like to, she was really yeah. good. Um, and I would like to get some more female fighters on. Um, yeah, let's do that. And I'm not sure we've had an Irish. Uh, oh, no, we had Reese McKees from Northern Ireland, didn't he? He was uh, our Irish contingent. Right, we've got loads of UFC to talk about, mate, from last night. Um, yep. Very quickly, though, let's have a quick chat about last week's UFC because we didn't do a show. Um, yep. We won't go fight by fight, mate. Just tell me some of the stuff which you enjoyed, which you didn't enjoy. and go Yeah, forward. yeah. Uh, well, uh, it was an amazing show, amazing event. Um, Ferguson performed as I thought he might, which was underperform from our normal expectations um but you can't take nothing away from Darius. Darius was impeccable showed great striking great wrestling amazing ground control um yeah you know, really happy for Darius. Darius is really you know making a big big name for himself um matt schnell uh, against uh Bonturin, that was a really interesting um fight um you know Bonturin come in on late notice as well um, and Matt Schnell is always very, very clinical with his striking. But Von Turin was was amazing. Very, very good with his striking. Great with his takedowns. Um, yeah, did, 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 did amazing. He really performed above any expectations, being that he took it on short notice. And I really rate that Matt Schnell as well. Um, what have we got? Uh, Chikagan against Adura. Adura have done really, really well, but she just began to fade. Um, she looked really aggressive, really strong in the first round. Looked like she could really trouble Caitlin, but Caitlin's cardiff. She just keeps going, and she plays so long. Um, she ended up literally just running away with the fight with with pace and fitness. Really, um, is really utterly impressive. Um, really enjoyed watching that. Uh, one of the performances that w- was really amazing for me, and he always performs really well, whether he wins or loses, is Edwin Barboza against uh, Shane Burgos. Um, I really rate Burgos, proper dangerous, um, you know, opponent for anybody. But Ezen Barbosa was just so clinical with his striking. I mean, it was just amazing. He's got that spinning back kick. Um, you know, he's got the leg kick. He's got the crisp hands. Um, really, really impressive. Um, I was amazed that Shane Burgos took the amount of damage he did um, on, to his leg without showing real signs that it was overly bothering him he did switch his stance occasionally but switched back to his traditional stance that suited him with with, with no further issues but what a strange knockout wasn't it it's was like a delayed knockout he got landed with a one yeah, two weird, it? and it paused and suddenly his eyes started rolling very, very unusual knockout but you know from what i've read about that this can happen yeah uh, but hats off for Barbosa. So i think since he's gone down a weight he's just looked absolutely amazing really <laughs> really really impressive just looks right for him, doesn't it? The way it does, stuff. it does. But I tell um, you what, really doing Burgos well. can take some shots, mate. He can, he, can't he? Really yeah. Good. So I'm not writing Burgos off by any stretch. I think he's had two losses in a row. I think, um, but <laughs> not someone insane, you can write off very easily. Um, yeah, he took and, some big shots in this. Yeah, one he did. Um, Barbosa. Um, shout out to Benil Derouche, by the way. It was just simply incredible, yeah. mate. He oh, is so good. Yeah, um, he is really, really impressive. And it's um, just one of those, mate, and it's just when you're that good, you're that good. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Um, another really interesting matchup, which is another standout, really. Um, you know, Ronaldo Jacare Sosa. Um, okay, so this guy in his in his forties now. Um, you know, probably a long time out of his prime, but always performs good. He always comes in shape. Um, was initially looking pretty good. I was really interested in the commentary saying how Munez um, <clears throat> would rate himself better on the ground in terms of MMA than. Um, Jacare, and you can't really odds it with the way the fight ended. Um, got into a really unusual back position, and as he was falling off the back, noosed up the arm under the armpit, a very, very deep style of armbar, and snaps Jacare's arm. Um, yeah. You hear it snap. Um, absolute horrific injury for Jacare at his age. I think and that's two losses in a row now. You know, yeah, you've got to wonder where he should be done. I, I hope for his own legacy that he does step aside now. Um, but Andre Munez, I mean, he said he was better on the ground. Isn't? Okay, one-on-one on the ground, probably not. 
uh, as good. But in terms of and the MMA, you can't argue the point. Mate, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that. largely, largely. But this is MMA. It is a different sport of its own. It creates more unusual situations in the ground exchanges because it's, you know, from standing to ground with strikes, there's, there's different things that happen. It was an unusual situation. And the thing is, with MMA, there's so many ways to potentially lose. And there's still so many sub variants of position exchanges and sequences that have never been done before still. And that was one such thing. It was a very unusual situation falling off the back like that, where you catch the arm because the arm's posted down because there's people trying not to engage on the ground. They're trying to stay up and, and mm. not be put to the ground. And that's what De Souza was trying to do. He's trying to stop being put all the way to the floor. And so he had his arm posted down, which ignited this unique opportunity to get that deep thread through armbar that he got but horrific when it snapped like that uh, i mean yeah, i cringed cool. unbelievable so i really wish jacare all the best in in recovering from this but i think also for his health and for his legacy that he's created that he does retire now but you know it's just my opinion only um, um and yeah i just wanted to touch quickly on um tony ferguson um a very one-sided fight with benil darush um What's next, in your opinion, for Tony Ferguson? Man, I, I just retirement. I, I just think he should retire. He's done amazing things. Um, I think his body's been through so much with his knee surgeries. You know, it it doesn't look very good on his feet with his footwork. Um, his hands are therefore a little bit adrift, which has always been that case. You know, he's always pushed forward. He's always got good cardio. There's no two ways about it. That he's always in shape. Mm. There's no two ways about it. it he's not. Uh, afraid of being hit so he's willing to plow forward but you can't win like that at this level uh, because he's because his footwork's a little flat now because i think his knees have gone um it's making his arms wayward and he's having to really over move his head to slip it's shots almost like these big like windmill yeah shots yeah. at some points and i yeah, just uh, I, I think it's to do with his knees and his body's just been through too much and such you know, not shame. being not not being in top tier mechanically, and the fact that you've got to bring into the fact that he's you know really in his twilight years, it really is becoming an, a young man's sport. And everyone's got better. Everyone else around him has got better. Exactly. Like, when you look at the division uh, he's in. They have. They have. It's such a shame that he never got that opportunity to fight Khabib at his peak, because I still yeah. believe that he could have at least given Khabib some questions when he was at his peak. He is not at his peak anymore, and I no. like. You know, I just I would hate to see him continue and end yeah. up getting hurt because when I was watching the Benil Darouche fight and I was thinking about the previous couple of fights he's had, I couldn't help but think like this guy is not the same guy that he was previously. Like, mm -mm. and if he goes in against someone who's a killer striker, like he could get really really hurt. Yeah, yeah. He's just not. His head movement is so slow. He was getting caught. Yeah, like exactly. Benil Derouche is not necessarily someone you'd associate with striking overly, but some of the strikes he hit were superb, sharp. Yeah, cliff, and they look. Yeah, I mean, I, I've dangerous. said to myself, he, you know, he he doesn't look caliber orientated with his striking. Let's just mm. say, um, he, he he's not coming from strict form. But the beauty of MMA is you don't have to be. And, and you know if you're using the strikes to clinch and and stuff like that you can break traditional form um and he just makes it work i mean what you can't argue against he gets results and he's moved up the ranks he's fought bigger and bigger names and he keeps improving with that um each time he fights someone of, of an increment improvement in level he's improved himself that and some to mm -hmm. keep putting his uh, opponents away this guy is really up there now. I mean, what what is he? He's got to be in the top three, three or two, isn't he? Now, yeah, surely, he surely, he's got right the um, so, amazing. I want to just move on to last night's UFC, just because I'm a bit conscious of time, mate. Of course, um, yeah. I want to make mention. <laughs> I switched uh, switched on this morning, and um, it was the Ben Rothwell versus uh, Chris Barnett. Chris, yeah, on the. Um, on the prelims it was and yeah. I switched it on and I was looking at it and I was thinking Jesus Christ I said I was thinking am I watching like you uh, am I watching a YouTube fight like the difference in their height and yeah and the, and the physique of Barnett for a second really threw me um yeah. but it was actually 
quite an enjoyable fight. Like they both had a go, and Ben Rothwell's very much a character. But I tell you what, don't be deceived by Chris Barnett's physique or his like. He's quite short. He's quite a big boy. Like he uh, nailed Rothwell with a couple of spin kicks to the ribs. Yes, he did. Very but, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he showed some agility at times, but his physicality ended up being his downfall. You yeah. know, he had no cardio tank to go through into anything of a later rounds. Um, and Rothwell's absolute cardio machine. Yeah. Um, he's someone that just keeps plowing forward. A very, very difficult opponent for anybody, and no matter what your skill set is. Um, very, very difficult to deal with. And, yeah, Chris Barnett just had no answers for him, really. He started becoming more and more gassed, more and more swingy, more and more clumsy. Um, and, and Ben Rothwell, yeah, he got him to the ground, and it was a, a, a submission. I think more to exhaustion, it was about a clinical submission. Mm. It was just well, done for. One of the things I like about Ben Rothwell is what he does. He's got that incredible cardio, but what he, what he uses is punches and kicks to the ribs, mainly punches to the ribs, mm. to wear his opponents down. So you yeah. don't necessarily, like he hit a couple of big shots to the ribs. They weren't like those shots we've seen in recent weeks, which floored an opponent. Mm. But they were just gradually fatiguing Barnett more and more. Yeah. Just though taking a bit of his air with that jolt, and he hit some big shots. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think you can be... Look, if you're going to be in the UFC and you're going to have that body type, you've got to be super, 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 super fit and not gas after a round. And mm. he looked gassed after a round, and I don't want to criticise him too much, but like he won round and he looked gone. Like he yeah, didn't have yeah. anything you, left. You, it was you, like you said, windmills and head down like this. Almost. Yeah, and that was and his exhaustion, and, and and that was his lack of. Uh, lack of agility once you know he, he did a couple of those kicks that you talked about in the first round but once his heart rate was above a, a, a certain beats per minute it was never recovering back down and he become more and more exhausted and fatigued and Rothwell does that to people as well if you're not fit he's going to expose that fact and he got exposed on that night so yeah yeah Rothwell's very good as well um, he is uh, doing that um so we move on to the main card mate um, I haven't seen all of these fights, so I'm going to leave okay. a lot of it to you, but we'll talk about sure. it. Um, so first up, we had uh, Jack Hermanson versus Edmund Shabossian. I was really looking forward to this fight. Yeah. I think yeah, Edmund, very, very good. I think um, Edmund Shabossian will be disappointed this morning. Yeah, because I, I think uh, when we were doing some predictions, you and, or wasn't it, uh, we was on there with uh, James Doolan. Yes. Yeah, and I think you both went for him, and I went for Ham Anson. Um, uh, Ham Anson's just such a, a, a cardio machine um, mm. and, and physical. He's not always the most beautiful technically, but um, he's, a, he's a handful. And it ended up look, just looking like he was just being too manly uh, for Edmund. Um, ended up manhandling him in that wrestling. I think once he knew he could get him down and control affairs on the ground, he, he sort of knew the ingredients to, to get the win and not to muck about with the striking too much. Edmund, when he was striking, looked really, really good, looked like he could really damage Hermanson. But Hermanson, he had the wrestling advantage and the physical advantage and really ground down on Edmund. Uh, Edmund was looking rather beat up and fatigued come the end of that third round. Um, it was a really good performance by Jack Hermanson. Um, yeah, we're pretty impressed with him, to, to be honest. Yeah, I had Shabassian winning the first round, and then um, yeah, he got found out a little bit in the wrestling. And, really, yeah, I gave. I was in, uh, the second round. I was like, nearly gave it to uh, Shabassian, but mm. I think I think it was close the fight. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think they gave it as unanimous twenty nine twenty seven, whereas I actually had it as a draw. As twenty eight, right. twenty eight. So that sh I think that just shows how close it was. But it was a good yeah. fight. Yeah, yeah, um, it, was, it was a good fight. But Hanson, he, he maintained his work rate throughout because he controlled yes. positions in the second and third round, and it, it made it it made the judges' eyes cast upon his actions rather than Edmund's. So yeah, well done to Jack Hanson. Yes, indeed. Uh, next up was Richard Richard Ricardo Ramos versus Bill Agio. Uh, with Ramos picking up a unanimous decision, 30-27, 30-27, 29-28. Uh, 
What do you make of this one, mate? This is one yeah, that I the, didn't see. Yeah, this is really good. Um, you know, Ramos, uh, you know, showing some really good striking and takedowns with a, a bit of jiu-jitsu as well. Um, and you had Bill Ajiro was really to his kicks. So he looked very taekwondo-y. I don't know actually what, whether his background is taekwondo, but looked very traditional. Um, but Ramos, yeah, he, he was just doing really, really well. There was one point in the second round, though, that Ricardo Ramos looked extremely gassed. And I think uh, Bill could have really pressured and may, maybe made something of it to try and put the fight away. Ramos was, was extremely gassed at one point. But uh, because Alergio was fighting on the outside with his long kicks, the work rate was not fast enough. And he did go in with some hands, don't get me wrong. But because he was predominantly looking for those long-range kicks, that constant pace wasn't enough to um, put Ramos into such a deficit where he'd get exposed with that cardio that he seemed to be lacking in that second round. Got second wind in the third round and started really pressing it. And yeah, yeah Ramos kind of like got his way with, with uh, Allegro in rounds for me, um, one and three. Um, but was just with that second round, having a few questions on his cardio. I don't know why he gassed out like that. Maybe mm-hmm. because he was doing such a mix of, you know, his punching, kicking and wrestling. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe that was the case. But I was kind of surprised that he fatigued like that. I actually thought, oh, my God, he could be done for here, especially with someone that's rangy with their strikes. You know, you get stuck on the outside. But he had such a wrestling advantage and didn't find it too hard in getting Bill down. So, yeah, uh, Ricardo Ramos, a good performance overall. Yeah, cool. Uh, next up was Norma Dumont versus defeating Felicia, Felicia Spencer by a split decision, 30-27-28-29-29-28. What do you make of this performance? Yeah, I'm kind of surprised it was a split decision. Um, I found that um, Dumont was just more explosive yeah, I think and so. um, more active, just more visual. Um, yeah, Sp- Spencer just... Um, it was just it was just struggling with the explosivity, I think, in in, in that sort of like close range. Um, mm. You know, she certainly had her moments where she was doing good, but Dermont really impressed me with her explosivity. Uh, like I say, when she was getting wrestled into, she would explode off and, and go into her strikes, um, really with big linkage of combinations. Um, and I felt like Spencer was just lacking a little bit of that. She just wasn't quite as explosive. Um, there wasn't really a lot else I can I can say about that. Really, there was a tip for tat and a little bit. It's mm. just that for me, Dermont was always a little bit more visual. I was just really surprised it was a split decision. Um, yeah, I thought Dermont picked up did enough to pick up the victory. Yeah, I think, I, had scored I, I, I think so. To her, so, yeah, I, I mean, it. there wasn't there wasn't a million miles away from each other level wise, but it was just that explosive visual part over Spencer that was just pouring gently onto. Uh, Dermont, but Dermont was the one that was exploding and looking more dangerous out of the pair, I'd say. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, yes, uh, split decision. So then we had Jared Van Der Ere defeating Justin Taffer by unanimous decision 30 27, 30 27, 29 28. Yeah, Taffer, he needed to get in close. Mm. Um, he, he needed to get in close, and, and you, need, you need to work hard when you're giving away height. Um, etc. Um, like like he was, I, I felt like he I just didn't have the energy levels that we've seen him have in the past. I don't know whether he perhaps trained a little different this time around. I, I'm not too sure w- what the reasonings was. Um, but what I was really impressed with um, Jared's cardio, his choice of strikes, um, his range. Um, so when I say talk about range. He was using his hands and his kicks and his knees all at the right time. He was mm. just making very, very nice choices. Um, okay, he got clobbered a couple of times by Taffa, which Taffa was really having to rely on heavily to try to get back into contention with this fight. Um, but Jared was really having none of it. Um, massively outstruck him on numbers, if you have a look at the numbers tally. Um, and that was because he had so many layers of the range covered. He had the hand range, the kick range, the knee range. He really just dominated it all looked really really impressive ended up with a nasty looking bleed on his head i'm not too sure if that was actually an open wound or a scuff i'm not too sure what what caused that whether perhaps a sneaky elbow got through didn't have time to look on any replays to look back on how he got cut um, but taffa's looked, looked better in the past though. yeah 
Um, that was opposite stances as well, but Joe just really, really impressed me with his choice uh, of striking sequencing, and it, it was really, really good. And it might be a case that Taffer didn't look himself because he couldn't look himself. You know, yeah, maybe it was that, that good. Give credit where it's due. Yeah, of course, it, it might be a case that Joe just performed that well. But yeah, um, someone else that you know he, he fought, fights a little bit like Ben Rothwell. You know, we're talking about Rothwell, um, very, very similar in that he constant just pressures you it's always chucking something at you is no no respite there's no time to to think you just have to constantly react yeah you can't get yourself together and and think about what your game plan is or how to yeah. adjust if you're going to fight vendera you got to be fit there's no two ways about that and 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 you've got to have something for each of the ranges that he's showing that he's very very proficient in um i suspect he's he's got very very good um fight iq um because he never ever just did things because um, they, they looked like well thought out sequences. Um, he just really had the measure of Taffa uh, strategically and tactically, really, really did. So, yeah, I've got to look forward to seeing his fights in the future. I think we could have someone there that could be making contendership in the next coming years. Mm. When Danny Batten's one to watch. Is yeah, I, I think so. I think so. There's, there you go. Maybe that should be a new feature. Danny Batten. <laughs> um, next up was rank number four, Carla Esperosa, Esperaza, v- defeating rank number three, uh, Jan Z- Zinanen. I'm not sure we're pronouncing her name right. Um, Z- uh, via, like that. Yeah. Via TKO uh, strikes uh, two minutes 58 into round two. Uh, big win for Carla Esperosa, Esperaza. Yeah, Carla had a game plan. And, and it worked. I don't think she should have been mincing around, wasting energy, striking with Yan. Yan's a very, very dangerous, very, very pressure-orientated fighter. Um, and Carla come in, t- took her down from the get-go and took the edge out of the striking whenever they did get back to the feet. Um, I do feel that, you know, she exposed Yan for a little bit of lacking of ability, not to work her ground necessarily, but to work her ground to get back up to the feet where she's, you know, I'd say he's more more likely to win against Carla. Um, she just didn't have the know how how to scramble out. She didn't appear to even be going to the right type of things. Wasn't framing in the right way. Just was not doing the right things. Um, I think once Carla had success so early on in that first round, she knew to just keep going to the same thing to keep getting her down. There was a point as well where, if you have a look at the first takedown, it looked like Yan almost twisted and busted her leg it really no, went no. over awkward on the leg if you have a look back and um yeah, i had looked back at it again but she didn't get injured from it but so close could have done look really really nasty carla was very very impressive um you know i i could argue that i was expecting yen to win this but carla performed um out of herself and you can you know thank the camp i'm sure as well for helping put not only the strategy in place but preparing her for the te- technical attributes to to nullify Yan's difficult and, and pressure striking. Yeah, I, um, I was really looking forward to this fight beforehand, and you're right, that was quite nasty on her knee. She could have done some yeah. serious damage to that. So, thankfully, looks like she didn't. But she had a... I think you're right, mate. Um, we've talked so much about um, like fight IQ and stuff like that. I really yep. believe <clears throat> that Asperaz had had a fantastic game plan she stuck yeah. to it she implemented it extremely well and what that meant yeah. is Jan was caught off guard and before she knew it she, before she was able to adjust anything with hers it was pretty much over like she yeah. lost the first round and then you know a couple of minutes into the second round it's gone um, yeah, yeah and that's how quick the top level that's how quick is you know these fights are gone and you've whether it's a mistake or a um, an error or the other mm-hmm. person's just a bit more organised in those early moments the sure. fight can be over can't it and yeah that's why it's the top level I guess yeah so the main event of the evening mate was this a shock for you or not Rob Font ranked 3 defeated Cody Garbrandt ranked yeah four. yeah this was surprising um, yeah Co- Cody's main issue through through this fight ended up being static head he had good footwork but his head was just on the center line 
you mm. have a look at the way Font was coming in striking, he was always edging his head off centre as he was striking forward. Um, but in the very early first two rounds, you could almost argue C Cody may well have picked up the wins on the first two. It's possible because he was nailing the, cut, the takedowns, but we just weren't doing enough with them. Um, I would have perhaps been pushed to give Cody possibly the first round um, on the control, but he was getting landed on more by Font. And um, of course, as the rounds went on, the less Cody was able, able to actually succeed with those takedowns anymore and was just getting outstruck. Um, and it weren't with such single strikes. These were actual combinations. There were sometimes Font was landing three at striking combinations. It was really looking like a difficult night for Cody. Um, Cody also looked a little bit down on his cardio, I, I, I suppose. He just didn't <clears> have <throat> the edge that Font had. Um, didn't look now, as fit it, as he normally did, I didn't. No, he didn't. Um, who knows what what that is? Maybe it's a case that just Font was just fitter uh, and Cody was his typical fitness and Font just outrun him there. But Cody began to fade and get hit more and more throughout the, the rounds. Um, there were some times I was worried Font was going to actually put him away at some point, which we've seen can happen to Cody. You know, he's been knocked out before. Um, he was getting hit that frequent. I thought that that could be the case. Um, Font was really amazing, though. Um, performed ever so well. His range with his hands was just on the money throughout. Okay, he got taken down a little bit, but he was doing such a good job um, underneath. I think he hit, also hit a, a, a weight. I think it was this one that he hit a weight of sweep, or maybe a bit was in another match, you have to forgive. Um, but he was do, uh, being so awkward underneath. He was able to get back to his feet with no real consequence of ground a pound upon himself. So he really wasn't taking a lot out of him. And it was Cody trying to keep him down that seemed to be exasperating him uh, mm. more. And he just began to fade from round three onwards. It, it just didn't look like Cody could, could get, get back in, even though he did land a couple of shots uh, that could potentially have been consequential. But I think for the fact, like, fact that he had lack of energy and he was on the demise physically, he wasn't able to hurt Font with those shots that he did land upon him. Uh, Font was amazing. He really was impressive. I think, when Cody had successes in the first two rounds with some of those takedowns, I think he should replace those successes, obviously, because the work rate's high um, to continue to do takedowns over five rounds. I think from round three onwards, he should have been targeted that lead leg that he actually got good access with the uh, outside shin kick. Um, it looked like it troubled Font, but I think it went unnoticed by either the corner team or, or Cody or both. Um, they just didn't seem to pick up on it. But I think there was a weakness there on Font's shin, but it didn't get capitalised on. So I think there was a little strategical pla um, in-game planning error there. something they could have done there. To yeah, I think there was something they could have done to, to put it back, but it was not recognised and it just looked horrible for Cody, really, from third round three onwards. I just, I think I've got to say, I think Rob Rob Font is a killer. Um, he's a real good fighter. There's a reason he's ranked above Cody in the fights. It's just because of who Cody Garbrandt is, you almost just kind of people just, yeah. just assumed that he was the the favorite, and he would. I, you know, I did that. Of, I yeah, I did that. Um, I thought Cody was going to have this, but yeah, Font Font was looking incredible. I've got to say, and he he's gone up in my estimation now for sure with that performance yeah and no, I like you he's got um, he's got every right to ask for a you know a title shot at the end of yeah. the day he's ranked three he's just beaten Cody Garbrandt who's a big name why yes. wouldn't he ask for a title shot exactly the the he's in good position to do so absolutely mate um, okay so just to finish this off mate we'll get, have a little quick look at next week's UFC because uh it's been a quite a long one this evening. First show back as well. Yeah. Um, so let's have a go and see. So we have uh, the main event next week, mate, is Rosenstruck versus Augusto Sakai. Who you got? Uh, uh, Rosenstruck was disappointing, I think, last time around, wasn't he? Um, I'm just trying to remember. Um mm. I forget, mate. I can't remember how he did last time. Um, oh, do I go Rosenstruck? Uh, 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 he's a bad yeah, man, I'll, mate. I'm going to go Rosenstruck. Let's go Rosenstruck. Yeah, he's a, he is a bad man. I think Sakai has got skills, but uh, Rosenstruck yeah. on his day is a he's a big boy, a bad boy. 
Um, yeah. I'd go Rosenstruck. Then you've got co-main event, Walt Harris versus Marcin Tibera. That is an interesting fight to me, I've got to say. Ah. Uh. I'm going to go with Walt Harris just because I like him and he's been through uh, a lot of stuff. But he's also a very, very I, well, good I, I'm, I'm going to go against Sean on that one. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go against Tiberius, Sean on that one. Tiberius, Tiberius Yeah, him. he's he's, he's very good. Big fan of him. Um, the, uh, I think that's the only two fights, three fights. Um, and then we've got... Um, I just want to ask you about this one. You might not remember him because you memory's not always the best mate is it no but, it's uh, certainly fighter not. names but tana bosa is fighting uh Ila latifi on the prelims okay. um and we watched we've watched both of them latifi um, they are, did very well but more interestingly mate alan patrick is fighting at welterweight versus mason mason the dragon jones yeah, come on, Jones. Come on, Mason. So I'm looking mm. forward to that, mate. We'll get right stuck into that. Yeah, we will. We'll have a look at that in detail because yeah, like people look at it on paper. Oh, Mason lost his first fight, but like, he was. Um, they had a banger, didn't they? They just absolutely. They did. They, they both. They took both. No matter how that result shots. went down. Yeah. No matter how that result went down, they they had a great great fight together and um it didn't damage mason jones career in any way i don't think absolutely not mate um it was concussion central it was yeah absolutely was towards. yeah absolutely frightening um cool we'll be back next week probably with another guest i would imagine um to be announced to so keep an eye on the social media but um of course as ever you can send your questions in if you'd like and uh, recommend guests if you're friends with fighters or whatever and you you think they'd be make for good guests send them our way uh you can dm us on twitter instagram whatever or email us it's all good but uh, most importantly subscribe to youtube.com slash ace podcast nation click the bell for notifications follow the danny batten fight show at, at danny batten fs on instagram and twitter follow ace podcast nation spread the word about the uk's fastest growing podcast network and the danny batten fight show also follow ace podcast nation the place uh ace podcast nation see again my words mixed up again away day apparel <laughs> away day apparel look if i do that it's got it's like weird things <laughs> had to use zoom because the northampton internet uh guys thank you for watching listening as ever long show tonight but we had some stuff to cover We'll be back to the usual time next week. But uh, Danny, as always, a pleasure, mate. Thank you. Yeah, it's been good to get back to our good old routine. Indeed. Uh, we'll be back next week. See you later. Have a good yep. week. Be good. Don't go fighting in the streets. YouTube.com forward slash Ace Podcast Nation.